Okay, um, first of course, let me also thank the organizers for giving me this possibility here to present our results. And I will talk about a study that I've done in collaboration with Ricky Xing, Maxim Kodas, and Andre Chubukov. And um, yeah, we investigated the interplay of different types of orders in iron-based superconductors. So um, let me start with a typical phase diagram of an iron-based superconductor. Here at the example of beryllium iron arsenide. And uh, here we typically have a stripe magnetic phase for zero doping, which is sketched here. Um, stripe means that the spins are antiferromagnetically aligned in one direction and ferromagnetically in the other. Um, then up in doping, we find the superconducting dome with the Cooper press. And on top of the magnetic transition, there's the so-called nematic transition, where the fourfold rotation symmetry of the lattice is um, broken down to a two-fold one. And um, this can, for example, be explained by a so-called Ising nematic order. Um, in this case, the structural transition um, is due to the um, stride magnetism, which not only breaks the spin rotation symmetry, but also the lattice symmetry due to this um, different alignment in the both directions. And it has been shown in many papers, but for example in this uh, reference, that this transition might come ahead of the magnetic transition. Um, okay, then here are two other phase diagrams of iron-based superconductors. When one is for on the left, the one is for lithium iron arsenide, and on the right for um, iron selenide. And this time it's a function of pressure, but I would like again concentrate on the parent compound um, for zero pressure. And in lithium iron arsenide, we find there a superconducting transition. So this is the critical temperature of the superconducting transition, and um, no magnetism appears. And also for iron selenide, there is a superconducting phase at zero pressure or zero doping. And on top of this, this orange phase is again the nematic phase, the structure um, transition, um, which is here um, appears for a very large region from, I think, 8 to 85 Kelvin. And um, in this case, we don't have the stripe magnetism, which could explain this order. And um, then people have argued or assumed that this um, structural transition is due to orbital ordering, where the different densities of the iron orbitals are occupied differently. Okay, and this leads me to the following question, questions that I would like to address in my talk. Um, first of all, can we obtain superconductivity without the magnetism in the parent compound? Um, then what is the origin of this nematic order? And there we have these two possibilities, or mainly Ising nematic um, order versus orbital order. And then um, we would like to address if there's a connection between all these different phase diagrams and can we find kind of a universal description for the iron-based superconductors? Okay, at least one thing they all have in common, which you can see here. Um, they're shown different compounds of iron-based superconductors. Um, and they all have in common this um, plane here, where the red atoms are iron atoms and the yellow ones are nitrogen or chalcogen atoms. And yeah, these iron atoms are arranged on a square lattice and then the um, nitrogen or chalcogen atoms are arranged alternating on top and on below this plane. Okay, and we will also now, or it is assumed that this plane is responsible for the physics that we want to describe, so we will also concentrate on this one. Um, then one can have a look at the band structure. 
um, calculated from uh, the orbitals or uh, a tight binding description um, for this plane. And here you see on the left the um, resulting Fermi surfaces in the Brillouin zone, and on the right the band structure. Um, yeah, and here we have two hole pockets at gamma and m, and two electron pockets. And yeah, we would like to have um, kind of a simplified description for this, which is why people has, have often considered um, a so-called band model, where they um, restricted themselves to these uh, close to these Fermi surfaces, and yeah, describe the bands to, to um, reproduce these Fermi surfaces. And on the left, this would mean we restrict ourselves to this small area around the Fermi surfaces. Um, this we would also like to do, but in addition, we would like to account for the orbital degrees of freedom, so that we can, for example, um, investigate this orbital ordering. And therefore, um, as you see here, maybe there are only three colors, and the colors encode the different orbitals. So um, we will only include, or we will not only, but we will include three orbitals, which are important close to this for this low energy model. Um, yeah, and these orbitals are XZ, YZ, and XY iron 3D orbitals. And um, two of them, XZ and YZ, are um, connected by this fourfold rotation symmetry. Okay, on top of this, we then um, add interactions. Um, as starting point for our description, there, um, I depicted a few of them here. The first one, U1, um, and we derived them kind of are similar to a geology, so we account for all symmetry allowed for Fermi couplings in this model. And yeah, these are two other examples, U3, U2. And um, if we collect all of them in the full model, we obtain 40 couplings. Um, their starting point is given by the on-site interactions, where U and U bar are the typical hub density, density interactions for um, electrons in the same orbital and in different orbitals. And then we have pair hopping and exchange interactions, J and J prime. Now, of course, one can ask, OK, if I have 40 couplings, this is not really a simplified model. Um, but we will see that during the RG flow, um, the relevant processes will be singled out, and um, only a few couplings will turn out to be important. Um, yeah, let me again stress the advantage of this approach that we account for these orbital degrees of freedom. Um, they are, as I said, for example, important to describe this ordering, um, orbital ordering, where the densities of XZ orbitals and YZ orbitals at the Brillouin zone origin are um, occupied differently. Um, this has, for example, been observed in experiment, in an APIS experiment, as example that I show here. Um, and it, uh, it is shown as a splitting of the two bands here, which are degenerate for the fourfold rotation symmetry and then split due to these um, different occupancies. And then also these circular Fermi surfaces um, change to such ellipses, um, which they claim to see here. Um, yeah, let me mention another type of order where this um, is important. It's sketched here, but I don't want to go into detail. They call it orbital antiphase S plus minus superconductivity, where the orbital degrees of freedom play a role um, for the superconducting gap structure. And they, they claim that um, this explains the superconducting gap in lithium iron arsenide. Yeah, but so the message is orbital degrees of freedom are important. Um, then with this uh, setup, we will perform a Parkett RG study, um, which is kind of similar to the patching FRG scheme. So um, we also integrate out high energy degrees of freedom. We start with our model as a as, uh, model at the UV, then integrate down. 
um, thereby we include these um, one loop diagrams, all particle, particle, particle whole diagrams, which also talk to each other. In this way, the, the approach is unbiased, and um, yeah, they all diverge logarithmically, and we will also only include these logarithmic contributions. Um, yeah. Then with this, we can calculate the effect of couplings in the system um, and use them as inputs to calculate the susceptibilities for these different orders. So that in the end, we will decide um, with the help of the susceptibilities which order wins. And the largest or the diverging susceptibility will make the game. As I said, it's similar to the FRG patching approach, but we will. Uh, the difference is mainly that we choose our couplings by symmetry and not by these patching schemes. And um, yeah, we treat all these instabilities on equal footing, and it's analytically feasible. Then let me say a few words about the hierarchy in this of energy scales in this approach. Um, yeah, here are two. Here's the, the energy scale is depicted, and here this logarithmic energy scale, which will be our flow parameter. Um, and our equations are valid, uh, valid in this red area. We will start around the bandwidth, or at a scale of the order of the bandwidth, and then flow, um, flow down to lower energies. And the Fermi energy then um, cuts some diagrams and from here on, the instabilities um, evolve in an RPA-like fashion. So, later series um, should be this should describe the flow after the Fermi energy. Um, okay, so this means if the instability there um, that we observe, their ordering could occur, is be behind the Fermi energy, smaller than the Fermi. Uh, smaller than the Fermi energy, sorry, larger than the Fermi energy, um, our description is valid and we can see um, which vertex diverges the fastest. This is the instability that we look for. On the other hand, if we had, so this is depicted here. Um, then the second case is that the Fermi energy um, appears before the scale of the, in, uh, of the instabilities and from this um, scale on, RPA physics takes over. That means that probably the vertex that has the largest um, contribution, which is largest at the Fermi energy, will make the game in the end, um, which you can see here. So the spin density wave vertex is larger at the Fermi energy, and it will then win the competition. And then um, there's this third scale, the um, imperfect nesting scale. Um, if it's small, it's an irrelevant perturbation. Um, if it appears at any um, before the instabilities, it will cut um, the particle hole flow. Okay, so um, we've performed this analysis, and this is the result. We observe a flow to strong coupling here depicted for two different um, couplings, U1 and U1N. Um, and this signals an instability of our description. Um, the divergence of these couplings appears in a um, universal way, in the sense that um, flow um, such that they have fixed ratios at the end of the flow. Um, and this is also called fixed trajectories if the couplings reach this um, regime. To um, determine these fixed trajectories, we um, reformulate our equations um, in terms of the ratios of the couplings, these gammas. Um, then one of, we single out one coupling, which then diverges like this, and um, determine the flow equation for these ratios. And since they become constant at the end of the flow, we can then solve the fixed point equations for these ratios and also um, determine if they are stable. If we do so, we find um, these results. We uh, find four different fixed trajectories, and they are reached um, 
uh, as function of the starting interactions, these on-site interactions and quasi-particle masses. Here I show um, the regimes of the uh, different fixed trajectories as function of on-site interactions between in the same orbital and between different orbitals. And um, yeah, many there are two different classes of fixed trajectories. One um, is depicted here. In this case, the flow is effectively to a three-pocket model where all interactions with this um, two hole pockets at the origin become subleading and only the interactions between these three pockets are relevant. And um, the other case is a four pocket fixed trajectory where um, the M pocket hole po uh, the M point hole pockets um, become subleading. So we can describe the system effectively uh, with these four pockets. Uh, okay, so if you have determined these fixed trajectories, we calculate um, the susceptibilities in terms of the couplings or the solution of the couplings that we've determined. Um, yeah, here, if, therefore, we define um, such vertices gamma for the different fermion bilinears. Here, I've um, sketched one for a spin density wave bilinear between a hole and an electron pocket. And the susceptibilities are then given um, by the square of these vertices, these bilinears. And um, we find that the vertices scale like um, this critical scale minus our flowing scale to some exponent beta. So they also diverge. But if we integrate then um, this equation for the susceptibility, we find that it scales like this, like 1 minus 2 beta. And this only diverges is, um, if beta is larger than one half. If beta is uh, smaller than one half, we will find that the susceptibility um, will remain finite at this critical scale and this order won't develop. Um, okay, this is what we then calculated for the superconducting and magnetic instabilities. Um, these are the uh, these exponents, beta, and we see that in both cases for four-pocket and three-pocket models, um, the, the number is smaller than one-half. Um, and for the superconducting instability, is larger than one-half. So this means that if um, our flow is valid down to lowest scale, so the Fermi energy does not cut um, the flow, we will, superconductivity will make the game. You can see this here. Um, this is the susceptibility in both channels, spin density wave and superconducting channel. And you see, hopefully, that um, the spin density wave susceptibility remains finite, whereas the superconducting susceptibility diverges. Um, yeah, then we can determine the uh, superconducting instability, the, the gap structure, and it's of S plus minus types. This means that. Um, the gap on hole pockets has a different sign than the one on the electron pockets. Um, and this orbital antiphase um, superconducting state that I mentioned earlier is only subleading. Okay, um, and furthermore, although we do not solve some kind of gap equation to determine the gaps more precisely, we can anticipate due to this flow to an effective four or three pocket model, um, the gap size on the whole pockets here, or in the other case here, is probably much smaller than the other gap sizes. Um, then we have, um, as I said, this orbital or nematic phase in the phase diagrams. And um, here the situation is different for the three and four pocket model. Um, if the instability occurs before the Fermi energy is reached, we find um, this. Uh, for in the three-pocket model, there is no orbital or ordering because these pockets fall out. And in the four-pocket model, the orange line here is um, the Pomeranchuk, this orbital um, instability, and it makes, so it wins the competition in the end. On the other hand, if we hit the Fermi energy before these instabilities develop um, and RPA physics take over, um, we see that in both cases, 
the spin density wave is stability is the largest during most um, parts of the flow, so it will um, develop in the end. And then a Ginsburg-Landau type analysis tells us in the three-pocket case this magnetism is of order um, is of stripe type, whereas in the four-pocket case is of checker board type. So in the three-pocket case we find Ising pneumatic order, and in the four-pocket case there is no um, pneumatic phase. But this uh, brings me to the end. Um, let me conclude. I've shown you this. Um, Pocket RG study for a full five pocket um, low energy model of iron based superconductors. Very fine, amazingly, amazingly simple fixed trajectories. Namely, um, we can describe them as effective three or four pocket models at, um, in the infrared. And um, interestingly, we found that the same microscopic model provides two different scenarios for these iron based superconductors. One um, is captures, for example, the ph physics of beryllium iron arsenide, um, where the Fermi energies are probably larger than this instability um, energies. And in this case, a uh, stripe spin density wave occurs for zero doping in the parent compounds, and superconductivity then develops up in doping if nesting cuts this particle hole instability. And um, due to the stripe phase, we have Ising pneumatic order. Then the other scenario likely applies to lithium iron arsenide and iron selenide, where um, Fermi energies are pretty small. And in this case, um, superconductivity can occur without magnetism already in the parent compounds, and um, orbital order is possible. Okay, so and then hopefully these results will be, um, appear soon. And also, I would like to uh, say or uh, mention these uh, preprints. Um, this one is the basis for this calculation, which um, did a simplified uh, calculation of this model. And we will also soon put um, in, on, on the internet a study of these weekly uh, unstable fixed trajectories, which might also explain some important physics. So thank you for your attention.